He's the CEO of City Current, a newspaper columnist and the author of two books about philanthropy and giving back. And of course, he's the host of The Spark here on WKNO. I'm Michael Drake. Thank you for joining me for a conversation with Jeremy Park. Jeremy, welcome. It's fun. It's a fun little twist. Normally I'm, I'm on that side and now I get to be on this side. So well, we're going to have a lot of fun today because normally you're in this chair interviewing a lot of amazing guests, but today you're the amazing guest and we want to know so much more about you. So as we start, let's go back to the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your early childhood and your growing up. So I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but really grew up in Dallas, Fort Worth. And I tell people all the time is that um, my parents heavily engaged in the community. My dad's still serving on the boards with Boy Scouts, so grew up with Boy Scouts. But the thing for me and my brother, he's a younger brother, is we grew up in a household with an open door policy. So we grew up in Weatherford, Texas, which is like a you know, small suburb of Fort Worth and Dallas, but um, really at all hours, day or night, 2 a.m., 2 p.m., didn't matter. If families were down on their luck, lost their job, going through a divorce, difficult time, they would come to our house. And so for me and my brother, we got to see at a very early age just the power of helping people. And the more my parents helped, my dad was in the insurance business, mom was uh, in education, was a school teacher for many years. And 99.99999% of the stuff that people had problems with had nothing to do with insurance or you know, <laughs> my mom being like an English teacher. And so for my brother though, we, you know, we would have families come in all the time, young kids our age, and we'd be playing G.I. Joe and laser tag, kind of dating myself, but um, we just built these friendships with those, those other kids. But we also too got to see that the more my parents helped and opened those doors, really amazing things would happen to us. Uh, we get to go and, and meet like the Texas Rangers, or the Dallas Cowboys. And for an average family, you don't have access to those sort of things, but it was just because my parents helped. And to me, the, the kind of the biggest story that articulates is my brother always wanted to be in the Marines. He always wanted to serve our country. So the day he turned 18, he goes and he signs up. Eyesight wasn't very good, so he gets LASIK surgery. And it, it, approved, it was approved in Texas, but not necessarily federally approved. So he gets out to boot camp and he tells them, I'm excited to be here. They have a moment of truth. And he's like, I've you know, just had LASIK surgery and I'm ready to do this. And they're like, wait a second, that hasn't been approved. And so my parents were able to kind of finagle it and say, give us 48 hours. And so in 48 hours, they kind of quarantined Jeff, but my parents were able to get to a four-star general out of Quantico who was on vacation to approve my brother to stay in, in the Marines to be the guinea pig. And wow. so we go out to graduation and the commandant wants to meet this family that could get a four-star general on vacation. And he pulls us in and he's expecting a celebrity and, and walks my parents and we're all just average looking people. And he's like, you are not a celebrity. You're not what I thought. And how in the world did you pull this off? And my dad simply said, we help people. And when we need help, people help us. And I thought, you know, growing up to see that sort of extreme opportunity where your brother's dreams could have been shattered, and yet my parents sacrifice everything to get to where uh, my brother can fulfill those dreams, that level of sacrifice is huge. But just the power, once again, of helping people. And so I, from that day, I mean, I kind of built my whole career on just helping people. And obviously it's... Um, being a hard worker, first one in, last one to leave, all of those things, trustworthy and respect, but ultimately growing up in Texas and having that open door policy really shaped me and my brother who just rolled out of 20 years of serving our country as a Marine, so. Wow, what a great story. So y you say some things there that really resonate with me. So power of purpose, overcoming adversity. Obviously you had some powerful role models. What did you learn through all of that? I think, well, for me, carry the story forward because I think the biggest adversity that, I say the biggest, but one of the big ones that really shaped me was, so right after college graduation, the day after I graduated, I was a marketing major, um, moved to Los Angeles. And while I was out there, and even growing up, I was the weird kid that was like, I wanna be in movies and I wanna uh, be a musician and play my songs in front of thousands of people and I wanna play professional tennis. And my parents thought I was kinda crazy, like you're all over the charts. But I had big dreams and ultimately I wanted to make a difference. And so moving to Los Angeles, I felt that was a city where those dreams could come true. And they did. Um, I was able to play professional tennis, was the head tennis pro at Beverly Hills Country Club for a few years, uh, for five years. And uh, our, I got into music and our band had gotten signed and was playing all over and had a chance to be in TV shows and do other things. And all of it crashed down because I was playing tennis, blew my shoulder out. Then all of a sudden the band wasn't getting along. We were at odds creatively and just not happy and playing all these shows, but 
typical not making the money that we wanted to make and do the things we wanted to do. But within a very short window of less than a month, shoulder blows out, tennis career is over, music, play our last show, walk off stage, we're done. No more acting, no more anything. So everything I've worked so hard to achieve comes crashing down. And for especially you know guys, we put our ego and our identity in what we do. And so my identity is in being a, a musician, being a tennis player, being a, an actor, being all these things, and all of a sudden I have nothing. Mm. And that was a really kind of pivotal time on my end to go soul, soul searching and say, okay, well, what at the core am I really trying to accomplish? What, what's the driving force? If I can't play tennis anymore, if I can't play music anymore, if I can't do acting and try to inspire people on stage and, and through the camera, what can I do? And that's where I went back to serving in the community. And I think even coming here, we've lived here now for 13 years. My wife's family is in Corinth, Mississippi. When we got married and decided to settle down and say, okay, where do we ultimately want to live? It was between Dallas, Nashville, or Memphis. And we chose Memphis, not really knowing anybody here. We just said, we're going to come to this city because one, it was the nearest big city. And for what I do, I need to be in a big city. But it was close to her hometown. And not knowing anybody, I just started serving and volunteering. And I feel like you, you know, there's a ton of great quotes. You find yourself in the service of others. But that's true, is that the more you serve, the more you learn about yourself, the more you build the relationships. And I, I kind of boil it down to three truths. And this is something that I learned from my parents is that um, people physically solve problems. That's the, the first truth, is that money is a great resource, but a dollar bill doesn't walk, talk, parent a child, mentor a child, it doesn't physically do anything. People physically solve problems. So if we want to see the change, we have to be willing to be the change, right? And that's where by plugging in, the second truth is people provide opportunities for people. Um, you and I are a good example. Like we've done some amazing things together in our friendship, but it's by serving together we've built that friendship. And the more we serve together and work together and trust each other, the more opportunities for both of us. I open up to you and you open up to me, and next thing you know we get to meet John Bon Jovi and crazy things like that. Um, and then that third truth is that giving leads to growth for all of us, professionally, personally, and spiritually. And I think that's where, when you look at my whole career and everything I found within that moment of disruption and everything falling apart, ultimately that's what I leaned on was serving, connecting with people, and then ultimately trying to find ways to grow out of that and, and to, to build myself back up. And that's exactly what we did here in Memphis, coming here with nothing and, um, and creating everything that you see with City Current and the Spark and the Spark Awards and all this journey that we've been on together. So it's interesting, you know, you and I met many years ago when you came to City Current. I think that's how most of our viewers really know you. But when you look back over your career, don't you think that maybe every experience you had maybe prepared you for the moment to come to Memphis and what City Current is today? 100%. And I think, um, you know, you, you hear parents all the time, you want your kids to play different sports, you want them to do acting and speech and... Um, music and all these different things that, that one teach the kids and allow them to express themselves but the passion right and so to your point whether it was tennis music um, learning the entertainment business because I worked in radio and, and TV and all those in Los Angeles too every single moment prepared me for everything that we're doing here and when you look at the things that we do with City Current events media philanthropy those were all the things that were things that I was doing either as a volunteer and, and just learning, but to your point, being able to um, kind of take all these skill sets and now apply them. In the moment, I would have looked at it and said, no, that's, you know, I won't be able to do that. But now looking forward, it prepared me for all of this. And, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You never know all those adversities you go through. You look back later and it's like, oh, that's why that happened. It, it gave me the strength and the confidence to prepare me for this next step that I wouldn't have been prepared for before. Right, so I've had the privilege of being a charter member of, of City Current since the very beginning, and I've watched its evolution, which has been amazing, and it's actually changed the trajectory of my life, so I'm very grateful for that. But tell me your story of City Current, how it's evolved, where it is today, and, and where it's going in the future. Sure, so I think for, for those who don't know City Current, uh, privately funded catalyst is the way we describe it. Our mission is to power the good, and it really is that simple. I think when you say our mission is to power the good, which is my personal mission, our family mission, um, it, it makes it very clear in terms of what the path is, and it makes decision-making very easy as well. 
But the mission is Power of the Good. We're funded by over 100 different companies of all sizes, some of the world's largest, down to locally owned, uh, even some entrepreneurs. And so they put money in. That's our budget. We do as much good with it as possible. Last year, we operated in Memphis and in Nashville. We did 187 events in 2019 for Memphis. We did 186 in Nashville, so run in parallel. Um, but it's workshops and seminars, bringing in national guest speakers, anything that we can do to pour into people with content and things that will help them. But also, too, to break down silos and force collaboration, because back to people provide opportunities for people. We need to be working together to be able to lift our city. And the only way that happens is through events, physical connection. So events are key. Philanthropy is the next bucket. We give away hundreds of thousands of dollars to nonprofits to help fund their mission. But back to uh, people solving problems, that first truth, heavily focused on volunteerism. So turnkey volunteerism, things like Samaritan's Feet, where we have hundreds of volunteers. We wash kids' feet, give them new socks and shoes, uh, 600 kids at a time in many cases. And you get to see the need firsthand, and it blows you away. It's humbling that right here in our own backyard, kids don't have shoes. They have to share toothbrushes with their whole family. It puts it in perspective. But it also, too, it, it, it humbles you, but it also um, allows you to build relationships with kids that we would never normally come across. And you realize these are amazing kids, and they just, they, they just want a chance. They want an opportunity. So serving, to me, is one of the most important things that we do, is the physical service. And then the media, positive media. Call them every Sunday in the Commercial Appeal. I've been doing that for 10 years. Uh, the shows here on WKNO, so the Spark, Spark Awards, Conversation With, uh, Write for Forbes, two books, podcasts, Good Works videos, it goes on and on and on. But out of those, it's, it's not just a rah-rah of celebrating the good. It's taking the lessons that everyone is learning and being able to apply those. So that way, no matter where you live in the world, you can say, look what's going on in Memphis, look at what they're learning, and we can apply that in our own community. And I think that's the part is Memphis is, is such a beautiful city. Um, that's why my brother moved here, as I told him, is you, know, you can go anywhere, but here the CEO of the hospital will come in and say, you matter, I'm with you, we're gonna get through this together. And I love that you're in a tight-knit community here that gen genuinely cares. And I feel like that's what makes all of this really special is that uh, we have a group of very passionate, like-minded people that wanna make a difference so we get to collectively join forces and do good. Well, one of my favorite events that we do every year, obviously, is Samaritan's Feet. And the beauty of that is, as you said, you get to connect with people that you normally wouldn't connect with. And we all find out that we're connected and we're all alike. But to see a CEO or a leader sit humbly at the feet of a child and serve, I think, is one of the greatest leadership models I've ever seen. It, it's really inspired me. I think one of the greatest innovations that you've brought to us, and I'm very appreciative of it, is how you really took City Current from one level to the next by doing something deceptively simple but probably very complicated, and, and that is making it really easy for people, no matter who they are, young, old, engaged in the community or not, to show up, participate, and be, and to provide that connection. So tell us a little bit about that. I, I mean, I appreciate that, and I feel like our job is to make it easy. We live in a world where we're all super busy, we're fast-paced, we have families, and uh, we're, we're stretched thin. Time poverty is a very real thing, and it's only getting worse. And so to, to move the needle, you have to make it easy. And you also have to make it, I hate to say it, but the ROI, what's in it for me? We live in a world where everything is about what's in it for me. So if I'm going to give my time, if I'm going to uh, serve, I want to know what the return is on my investment. And whether that's a company, uh, an individual, a family, we're all busy. We want to know that what we're doing makes an impact, but ultimately that it impacts us too. And so for us, everything really is kind of working backward is we want to make sure that it starts on time with the events, it ends on time, that you're there with a group of very good people. Everything is organized for you so that all you have to do is show up, share your love, plug in and plug out. Um, but ultimately that there's the power of purpose, that, that you know why you're there and then you're touched in some way so that when you leave, you want to share that with others and you want to get more people because at the end of the day, I mean, Memphis is one of the most philanthropic, the most generous cities, but we, we still lag on the volunteer, the service side. And so for us to get where we need to be and where we want to be as a community and where we deserve to be, we need to all be able to raise our hand. And so some have more time than others, for those who don't have that much time, we've got to still mobilize them, so let's make that very, very easy. And, and I think that's, to me, at the end of the day, what everyone has to be focused on is 
How do we make it relevant? How do we make it easy for people to plug in? Yeah, well, you've done a great job of that, so thank you. So, on that vein, we talk a lot about corporate responsibility and engagement. So, again, we've seen how City Current has evolved over the years, and I think we're at a really interesting inflection point with new people in the workforce, what consumers are looking for, what employees are looking for. You, I've always said, are the most connected guy that I know. So, with all your experience and, and connection, what have you seen in, the, in regard to corporate engagement and responsibility. No, yeah, I'm, I'm, I admit, like I'm blessed in the sense that we have global leaders like Fred Smith and Richard Smith, and, and you look at the FedEx and the auto zones and to be able to interact and see things through their perspective, but through people like Maura Forbes and Rich Carlgaard at Forbes, I mean, the, the relational element of seeing things through their vantage point, but the stuff that I write for Forbes is a great example where I have to step back and look at what's going on. Because if you're not stepping back and looking at what's going on, the big picture, you're going to get lost in the weeds and you're going to get run over. And in a world where disruption is the norm and it happens every single day, almost every single minute, if you're not paying attention to what's going on, not just in your arena, but, but globally, it's going to be tough. And so for me in this world of CSR, corporate philanthropy, philanthropy, capitalism, all these buzzwords, um, social impact is now mandatory. And I think that's the biggest thing to understand is that it's front page of, of USA Today. It's uh, you know companies uh, across America without social impact culture will soon be obsolete. So I mean, there's all these quotes that basically point to consumers are looking at corporate America. They're looking at businesses to be engaged. They are making their purchasing decisions based on it. 85% of millennials, and that number is only going up, are basing their purchasing decisions on the social good efforts companies are making. So the consumers are making it and they want to see you physically involved like on social media, but also the employees are driving that. And to your point, um, there's study after study after study where employees are willing to turn down higher paying jobs for ones with purpose. They don't want to go to work where you're spending the vast majority of your time to fatten the wallet of the owner. They want to feel like they're making a difference. And you can look all across America, and there's, we've had all these different speakers who kind of talked on this, is you, know, you used to talk about community at your dinner table. Well, now nobody's eating dinner together. We're all on our cell phones or we're doing a million sports and activities. You used to get it at church, but now that's kind of breaking apart. So now employees are looking at corporations to say, I need you and I want you to teach me how to be involved in the community. But I also need you to give me the bandwidth. And so things like a modified work schedule where I can go and I can volunteer in the morning and then I can come to work or I can leave early like at 3.30, 30 minutes of drive time, volunteer from four to five after school tutoring and then I can leave at five like I normally would. Um, so the, the key driver though is that consumers are driving it, employees are driving it and I think all across the world we're looking for more purpose. And, and I would say this, especially like when I'm talking to groups is, I say that as a company is define your purpose. Like you need to know what do you stand for outside of what you do, what's your purpose? Companies like FedEx, Autos, and they put it right out on their website. This is who we are, this is what we do, this is how we give, this is our philanthropic statement. So what's yours? But then what's yours as a person? What do you stand for? What, what's your purpose? And then what do you stand for as a family? Have that conversation with your kids. Have that conversation with your coworkers. You'll be surprised. Some of them have battled cancer and they're their flag that they carry is for fighting cancer because of that. It opens up a wealth of just opportunities for you to learn about each other. But I feel like knowing your purpose is so important. And on my end, don't ever underestimate it because now uh, people are asking for that in your job interview. Not just, okay, you're great on paper, but what are you doing in the community? What do you stand for? The first time I met Fred Smith, he already knew what I was there to meet with him about. But he's like, what, what's your personal purpose? Great question. Right out of the gate. And you're just like, what? But I mean, I was prepared to answer that. Mm -hmm. Education. I'm serving on these boards that are focused on education, organizations like New Leaders. Um, my wife is in education. We believe that you know, the trajectory of lives can change through education. He's like, now we can talk. So that was your connection. You, you, you peel off those layers. Right. You want to know that the person you're talking to has layers, has depth and has something to, to really talk about. And so understanding and owning your purpose is, is powerful. And so I think that's where for me, that conversation always starts. And there's a, there's a, a million other things when trends in terms of the one for one model and changing sustainability and the you know, turnkey volunteerism. But I think 
The biggest one to understand is that social impact is now mandatory. And if you start looking at that purpose and then how do I carve out time and intentionality to get involved with my purpose, to live out my purpose, uh, there are so many easy ways to do it. And that's where the real magic comes in is you realize it doesn't have to be something that I just wait around for the weekends. I can do it with every single thing I do. I can live my purpose and create my legacy every single moment. And that becomes your mission. Yeah. I think that's great wisdom. So you talk about all the things that you're involved in and what you do, and it's amazing to me that you find time for all that. I'm sure that the viewers are curious how you manage time management. Give us a clue about that. I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> actually, so, you know, for anyone here in the Mid-South, you can go to most coffee shops and be like, hey, can I get a honey vanilla latte? And they'll be like, oh, Jeremy Park must have sent you. Um, so, uh, no, I mean, I, I think I, I love that I get to wake up every day and make a difference. And I'm obviously an extrovert, so it's like if I'm in front of people, I'm good. When I'm sitting in front of the TV, I crash. <laughs> so it's like I'll go as long as I can, burn that energy. But um, I think when you love what you do, and, and you know, obviously that exudes that energy. And the older I get, the more I'm protective of my time and my energy. And being laser focused on what is my mission, how do I live out that? So that way, to your point, I'm not wasting much time. When I wake up, I know exactly what I need to accomplish. I know exactly where my, my kind of boundaries are and I can play within that. And then, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm definitely a late night person where I'll try to wake up as late as I can. Um, but most of my, I mean, I'm in meetings all day, every day from eight till 4.30 or five, get the kids to all their activities, come home, Meredith usually goes to bed about 10 and then I'm answering emails and writing and doing the stuff from 10 to about 1 a.m. I get emails from you at strange times of the yeah, day so and I mean, night, it, so. But I figured, you know, but I like the fact that I can control the day, where if I need to leave within that window to be at a kid's activity, you know, to be at Kaysen's thing or Cooper's thing, I can do that because I know I can make that time up. And I feel like we live in a world now where it is 24-7. It's a 24-7 responsibility. For me, I view it as that. And so I am actually empowered because I can take control of that and use that versus fighting it. So what would you say to that person who doesn't know what their passion or their path in life is, or maybe they've known it, but they've lost it and they're trying to rediscover it? What would, what would your advice be to them? I think one is it'll change over time. Um, when I you know, look at my purpose and passion growing up as a teenager, very different than when I was in college, very different than when I was a uh, you know, young professional and now I'm in my 40s. So it, it, it changes, but I think back to service, um, I had no idea what I was going to be doing and that, that's why I was a marketing major. I'm going to have to market myself. Like I'm, I'll figure this out. Right. And I think you, the more you pour in and you serve. And I would just say when you find your purpose, that due north can be working with maybe it's animals, uh, seniors, sports, kids, just in general, maybe it's education in that sort of spectrum. Maybe it's mental illness. When you find something and you kind of say, that's where I'm going to start pouring into. And then, and obviously we can help, but there's many organizations that can help you steer toward those organizations. You find an hour a week, 30 minutes a week, two hours, whatever time you can commit, and you start pouring in, you will find really fast uh, what moves you. And that becomes water naturally seeking its course. That becomes the energy that you then start to do. Because when you start seeing the impact that you're having on someone else, and they're saying, hey, Thank you so much. When you serve 600 kids and they're coming in, they're saying, this is the first new pair of shoes. This is, the, this is the first time a stranger has ever given me anything. This is the first time we had one that was their, her birthday. No one's ever acknowledged her birthday. Mm. That was her birthday gift, a new pair of shoes. And we sing her happy birthday. And so once you have those moments, they don't let go. And that becomes the contagious energy where you're just like, I, I want to keep doing this. I, I want to see more of this. I want to put more love in this world because in the end, that's what's going to move all of us. And, and isn't it amazing that when you start down that path, it seems like, and you and I have talked about this before, the universe begins to conspire to make that happen. The right people in the right situations just seem to show up. You and I have seen that over and over. I agree. And I think that you... You know, dark times are tough, but the darkness, what penetrates is the light and, and love and light and those things that when we start to do it, and it's, it's not always easy. 
if you're having a bad day, it's, it's easy to get down on it and, and kind of beat yourself up or something happens. But when you start looking at, wait a second, I'm, I'm a, a champion for this community and for others. When you put on that sort of a hat and you view yourself as, as such, the world changes. And um, there was an exhibit that had come through uh, a few years ago. And it was basically pivotal moments in history and how one person kind of transformed it. And there were hate crimes going on in Billings, Montana, and the newspaper ran menorahs and said, we're gonna kick this out. And you think about that where a media company basically took ownership, and they did, they drove out the hate. And I think that's the kind of stuff that don't ever underestimate the power of one, mm -hmm. the power of one's story, help one, help many, stealing Mick Ebling's quote, um, but the power of one person to share their energy and love to then inspire others to really create a movement. We need more of it. Wow, that's again, great wisdom. So where can people find you? Because I know they're gonna wanna find uh, all the different outlets that you're on. Tell us about that. All over the place. Uh, no, so the easy website, citycurrent.com, uh, C-I-T-Y current.com uh, is an easy one. My personal is Jeremy C. Park. All over all the Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, it's the at City Current, at Jeremy C. Park. So we've made it very, very easy to find us. Um, but I mean, you know, we're, we're here to help and whether that's obviously connecting in locally or even trying to share and inspire others around this world, that's the mission, that's the goal. Well, Jeremy, it's been my honor and my privilege to have a conversation with such a great friend. And I thank you for joining me for a conversation with Jeremy Park. Thank you.